my lap today. There's no junior church, so this will be helpful because young children, you can help me out today. I have not counted the number of times that I'm going to say he is risen or he rose from the dead. So if some of you young people can keep tally of that and let me know at the end of the service, that would be really helpful. So it's been um, nearly three years ago since we started our, our study of the Gospel of Luke. And today we come to the resurrection of Jesus Christ on this Easter morning of 2022. And the sermon will include an opportunity for you to participate. We will be doing the response of affirmation. I will say, He is risen, and you will say, He is risen indeed. Well done. So please stand with me for the reading of God's Word from Luke chapter 24. And then we'll make our first affirmation together, and then we'll have prayer. Luke 24, beginning in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the tomb, the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. He is risen. I'd like to ask Sila Tuju if you'd pray at this time, please. Let us pray. Father, we are here because you made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We give you thanks because you're worthy. We give you thanks because you're good, your mercy endures forever, and your truth is everlasting. And so now, as we come to the preaching of your word, we commit your servant Steve into your hands. We pray that you'd anoint him to preach your word boldly. And we ask that you'd open our ears, that we would hear it, you'd open our hearts, that we would receive it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. So Luke, in his gospel account, he tells us several things, several things that happened on that first day, that first Easter when Jesus rose from the dead. Um, he spoke first about the women who went to the tomb and they found it empty. Then after that, he'll tell us that they encountered angels, and those angels told them to go and tell the disciples. And then finally, he tells us that Peter and John ran to the tomb and they found it empty as well. Now, as it relates to the women who are mentioned here, they are mentioned several times as it relates to the death of Jesus Christ and His resurrection. They watched Him as He died upon the cross. They watched Him be buried. And the Bible says that after that, they went and prepared spices and oils to anoint His dead body on the third day. They did not go the next day. They didn't go the second day because that was the Sabbath. Rather, they honored the Lord and they obeyed the Lord by keeping His holy commandment to rest on the Sabbath. But it's kind of interesting to look at, find out who was involved, who was included in this group of women. We don't know all of them that went to the tomb, but there are four that are mentioned by name in Scripture. Three of them are found in verse 10 in Luke 24. Look at verse 10. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Now, if you want to add a fourth one that we know by name, it's found in Mark's Gospel that was already read to us. Her name was Salome. Salome was, went to the tomb, and she was married, if you look at Scripture, to Zebedee, which means that these were the parents of James and John, the sons of thunder. That would mean Salome is the one who said to Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, I want my two sons to sit on your right and on your left hand. And so we have Salome, and then we have Luke's list, Mary, the mother of James the Less. This was a disciple as well. This Mary is typically known as the other Mary in Scripture. Then we have Mary Magdalene, and you're going to want to keep your eye on her. She appears to be a very fast runner going back and forth from the tomb. And she's also the first one to see Jesus risen from the dead. In addition to that, Luke mentions Joanna. And Joanna was married to Cusa. And you say, why is that significant or is that important? Go to Luke chapter 8. Luke has already mentioned her once before in Luke chapter 8, a lady by the name of Joanna. And this is actually going to connect some individuals in our account of Jesus' death. Luke chapter 8, and look at the first three verses there in Luke chapter 8. 
Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, one of them, here it is, Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others who provided for him from their sustenance. So the connection I want you to make here is notice that Solo, uh, uh, Joanna married to Cusa and connected to Herod. And this happens to be Herod Antipas, who for the record is the guy who had John the Baptist beheaded. Um, this Herod was interested in Jesus early in his ministry, wanted to see him, wanted to meet him. And then later on, he wanted him dead. And when Jesus is going to Calvary to die, Herod is curious again. And if you remember, he wants to meet Jesus because he wants to see Jesus perform a miracle. And it would seem to stand that he had heard what Jesus did for Joanna, and so he wants to see if he'll do it for him as well. With that being said, uh, Jesus did meet Herod. You'll recall that he was first tried by Pilate, and then he was sent to Herod. He didn't perform a miracle, and Herod said, I find him innocent, send him back to Pilate. And so we have these four women who are mentioned by name. We have Salome, we have Joanna, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary. Three of them were also beneath the cross of Jesus, if you look back at the record. The other Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Salome. But there was a fourth woman mentioned beneath the cross of Jesus as well. And she was there when Jesus said, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. It was Mary, the mother of Jesus. I mention that because she was not mentioned when Jesus died. She was not mentioned seeing Jesus buried. And she was not mentioned as going to the tomb. And it makes me wonder, is it possible, did she believe that her son, whom three decades prior was born to her, a woman who knew no man, a son was given to her and announced by the angel Gabriel, did she, a woman who had pondered the birth of her son in her heart, did she not need, feel the need to go to the tomb? Is it possible that she believed that Jesus would rise from the dead? We can't know for certain, but it sure makes me wonder. In any event, we have these women who arrived at the tomb on that first Easter. They found it empty, and we know that they found it empty because He is risen. Well done. But prior to the women arriving at the tomb, something else took place. As a matter of fact, there's several other things that took place on that first Easter which were not recorded by Luke. And the first one, we're going to need to go to Matthew chapter 28. There was an earthquake. There was a great earthquake, and then there was an angel who rolled back the stone. And this is Matthew chapter 28. We don't know how great this earthquake was, but you might remember there was an earthquake at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, and the whole mountain was quaking, and the people were trembling. There was an earthquake when Jesus died. Rocks were split in two, and tombs were opened. And there was an earthquake when Jesus rose from the dead. This is Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now, I have an opinion at this point. I do not think that the angel rolled back the stone for Jesus to emerge from the dead. I think the stone was rolled away for other people to enter and find that he was no longer there. And I say that because you'll remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't need to go through doors. He could pass through walls. But not only that, did you notice what the text said? The guards were afraid having seen the angel. It doesn't say they saw Jesus risen from the dead and then they were afraid, but rather it was just the angel. And the Bible also says that they shook for fear. And their fear was so great having seen that angel that they became as dead men. And I do think that that phrase is significant because I think it's indication of their true spiritual condition. They were dead. They were spiritually dead. Now let's go back to Luke and see the next thing that took place, and that's the women as they encounter not one angel, but two. Luke 24. One angel rolled back the stone, but there was another one present there to meet the women. This is Luke 24, now in verse 4. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth and said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you 
when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Now listen to verse 8. And they remembered his words. The guards, they saw the angel, and they were afraid, and they were as dead men. The women, they were perplexed, then they were afraid, and then they bowed their faces to the earth. Their fear seemed to provoke in them a sense of humility. But I think more importantly, you'll notice in the passage, a light bulb came on. They suddenly remembered the words of Jesus that he would rise again. I think this is an important verse as well. It's an amazing thing to see. We've been told that knowledge is power. And I would say knowledge is not power. You have to have understanding. And that understanding comes by God when the Holy Spirit illuminates the mind. You can have an audible ear and hear all kinds of things. But until God grants you spiritual ears to hear, you'll not understand anything. The angels spoke, and suddenly they remembered the words of Jesus that he would rise from the dead. The next thing they did is they went and told the disciples, verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the leaven and to all the rest. Now, Matthew and Mark both tell us that an angel told them to go to the disciples with the message that Jesus is risen, and so they did. And John tells us that Mary Magdalene, she took off running. So again, keep that in mind. She ran back, and from the sense of the reading, Mary Magdalene arrived first, told them all that she had seen, and the other women arrived and confirmed their story. Now look at verse 11. After they arrived, tell the story, look at verse 11. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe. So if you're keeping track, the guards were afraid and were as dead men. The women perplexed, then afraid, but they bowed their heads. The disciples, having heard the story, not having witnessed the empty tomb themselves, the Bible says they did not believe. But Peter and John then took off running. And look at verse 12 now. We see them now running to the, to the tomb. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. The response of Peter, he got there, the tomb is empty, and he marveled. But what about John, the other runner on the way back to the tomb? What was his response? Well, for this, we're going to go to John's Gospel, John chapter 20, because John records for us what took place that day from his perspective. John chapter 20, and we'll begin at verse 3. John 20 and verse 3. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, that's John speaking about himself, were going to the tomb. And they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. John, speaking about himself in the third person, doesn't want to boast too much, but he was the faster runner of the two. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and notice this, and he saw and he believed. So John, the faster of the two runners, he arrives, he looks inside, he sees that it's empty, but he doesn't go in. Then Peter, the fearless, if you will, at least he wasn't afraid to speak up and jump sometimes before he thought. He arrived, he went in, and then John followed him. And at that moment, John's testimony is, is that he believed. By the way, this is the first individual that says he believed. It was John, the beloved disciple. But I want you to notice verse 9. How is it that he came to believe what took place? Look at verse 9. For as yet they did not know the Scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. What does that mean? As if yet they did not know the Scripture that he must rise. They had heard Jesus over and over again, but they didn't believe. They didn't know. They didn't understand. Again, God must grant ears to hear, eyes to see, and minds to receive the truth. And to me, it's rather fascinating when you think about it, because Simon Peter made that great confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That truth, that confession that all must ultimately make in their heart. But even he was unable, having heard Jesus several times state that he would rise, he was unable to know the truth. And we're going to see the same thing over and over again with the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. So many people will see him, but they didn't know who he was. 
He was with them. They had been with him before, but they didn't recognize him until they were illuminated. And so then what did Simon Peter and John do after they saw the empty tomb? Kind of interesting. Look at verse 10. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. We've seen the empty tomb. John believes, and what do they do? Well, let's just go home. Keep in mind, they had not yet seen the risen Jesus Christ himself. But that day had not yet ended. There's still more to the story. And we're going to take a closer look in the weeks to come at the appearances of Jesus after he rose from the dead. But I think that the first two are significant for today. And so I want to continue on, and I want you to notice the first one to see Jesus risen from the dead is Mary Magdalene. So look now, beginning in verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So if you remember... Peter and John ran to the tomb, and it appears that the women returned as well, and Mary must have been running as well. She wasn't as fast as them, although as I was thinking about it, she'd already run the course one time. Maybe she would have beat them if she had a, a, a good start with them. But she came. They had already left. Uh, John and Simon Peter are, did not in, encounter the angels, but there were two of them, and Mary was weeping. And those angels comforted her. And she turned and she saw Jesus, but she did not recognize him. Keep in mind, she was healed by Jesus. Seven demons were cast out. She traveled with him. She was beneath his cross as he died. She saw him buried. And yet again, she wasn't given the ability to recognize him until he spoke her name. How sweet that must have been to hear your name spoken by Jesus and then to recognize him. This is grace. God speaks and we see, we hear, and we know. I think this is a reminder of his effectual call. He speaks life, and suddenly the blinders are off. The dead sinner is now born again, and we cry out for the first time, Abba, Father. And you'll notice the response of Mary. What did she do? The Bible says she clung to him. And I would say this is the response of all who've been called by God, and then call out to the Heavenly Father to cling to him, to cling to Jesus, until the day that we die or the day that he returns. And then notice, not she didn't go back home. After this experience, she went back to tell the disciples, verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, that He had spoken these things to her. She had a story to tell. It was no longer just that the tomb was empty, but now He is risen, He is risen indeed. The second appearance was to women as well. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. So Mary Magdalene, the first to see Jesus risen from the dead, and then other women as well. And so it appears that Peter and John ran to the tomb. They had left. Mary ran to the tomb. She sees Jesus. She has left. And now there's other women who arrive. Matthew 28 and verse 9. Matthew 28 and verse 9. And as they went to tell His disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren, go to Galilee. There they will see me. So again, these women have been to the tomb now twice. No doubt they're going back to say, Listen, we've been there twice. It's still empty. Jesus is not there. And Jesus appears to them. And you'll notice what they did. They fell at his feet and they worshipped him. This is really sweet to see Jesus, to cling to him, to fall at His feet and worship Him. To be able to say with the writer of Hebrews, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. 
I want to make two points at this time, two things that I think are critical and important. The first one being this, the resurrection of Jesus is critical for our salvation. We often think about His death at Calvary at where He paid for our sins. And that was necessary for second degree imputation so that our sins could be placed on Him. When He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He became sin for us. As already was prayed, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. But the next part, so that we might become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. That was not accomplished at the cross. Imputation comes because Jesus rose from the dead. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Christ must be risen so His righteousness can be given to us. And for that we say, praise God, it's a full salvation. Not to get us to neutrality, but to get us to where we're acceptable to God. But the other thing I want to mention in this passage, which I think is extremely beautiful, is the dignity and the reaffirmation of Jesus Christ as it relates to the dignity of women. The first witnesses to Jesus risen from the dead were women. And the first woman was a woman, seven demons cast out of her. If you study it out, it would appear that she was the sinner that anointed Jesus and was stated, why would Jesus let this woman be here? She was probably a woman who sold herself just to survive. And she would be unacceptable in polite society, and she is the first one to witness Jesus risen from the dead. The other women, the other women would be considered unacceptable in a courtroom in that day. They would not be allowed to give testimony. They would not be allowed to witness to the truth. And Jesus and God determines that it will be women who will be the first to be able to proclaim with confidence that He is risen, He is risen indeed. Which brings us to our conclusion for the day. In this short time today, looking at these passages, we have seen the response of at least 20 people so far in our text and how they responded within just a couple hours on this first Easter. There's another response I want us to see, though, in Matthew today, before we finish up here. Matthew 28, verse 11. Now, while they were going, and that's the women, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. Now, who are these guards? They are guards who were guarding the tomb. They felt the earthquake. They saw the angel. They saw the stone rolled away. They're coming to report to the religious leaders what had taken place. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them, His disciples came at night and stole Him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ear, lest you get in trouble, we'll appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So my question for you today, for all of us this morning, is what is our response to these things? I certainly hope that you would not believe a lie or tell a lie that Jesus did not rise from the dead. And I hope that what you have is more than just fear to be like a dead individual. And I would say for those of you who do not yet believe, may this be the day of salvation. May today be the day where you repent of sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Be not like those who did not believe. Rather, be like those who marveled. Like John who believed. Be like those women who saw Jesus, who clung to Him, and who worshipped Him. And be like those women who then went out and told the story that He is risen. If you do it again. He is risen. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You that the truth is, the verdict is, the evidence is in, the testimony is sure, that Your Son Jesus, that You rose from the dead. Rising He justified freely forever. And one day You are coming again. Help us to sing Your praises. Give us strong faith to continue to trust and to believe. And Lord, I do pray if there's someone here today who doesn't know You, that You might Visit them today with Your grace, that You might open their eyes, that You might speak their name and speak life today and cause them to be Your children. For the rest of us, God, please help us to be bold and confident to proclaim that Your Son is risen indeed. And I pray in Jesus' name, Amen.